Good evening, good afternoon, good evening tonight. We are here for our Bible study once again at our remote location. Good evening to everybody. We are in uh, St. John chapter 4. St. John chapter 4 is where we are tonight. I guess you've already seen the prelude to our Bible study. I will, I will spare you and I won't sing tonight. So we're in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, we will begin with verse number 7. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 7. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are, all that you do. We thank you for blessing us, Father God, and blessing conditions to be as well as they are. We ask you to bless us as we prepare for your word. Bless your word, Father God. Bless your word to fall on good soil. Bless your word, Father God, to be what you would have it to be on tonight. Speak to us through your word, that your word, Father God, will manifest itself in us and we will move forward in your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight here at our Bible study. Let me begin by saying thank you again to all the pastors, all the churches, all the organizations, all the individuals who's been a blessing to us during this downtime. It's not the pandemic this time, it's sinners that have us down and we're going to have us down and we're going to move forward in the name of Jesus. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for your donations. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your participation. We're in first John chapter four. 1 John chapter 4, our verses for tonight are verses 7 through verse number 11. Verses 7 through 11 is where we are tonight. We're looking at 1 John chapter 4. We are continuing what John talked about on last week, and what he said to us was very, very clear. He says, every spirit that speaketh, don't you believe it? John says, do not believe every spirit that speaks every spirit that claims that it's of God. Do not believe it. Matter of fact, he says in verse number one of first John, he says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, test those spirits. It goes on to say father that you can always tell when a man is speaking from God, when a woman is speaking from God, when one is speaking from God, they believe, first of all, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that Jesus Christ has already arrived. Jesus Christ has already come. He says, once they confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, they are of God. But he goes on to say, whenever an individual denies the fact that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, then that prophet, that man, that woman, that person is not of God. So he says to us, little children, whatever you do, follow those spirits that are of God. He says, test the spirit, try the spirit. Put the spirit on trial. Now, when he talks about these spirits, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit because you're going to utilize and you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to utilize you in order to test these other spirits. Men all over this world got these great testimonies. They got these great prophecies and some of them even call themselves prophets and apostles. But the fact of the matter is you must first test those spirits to make sure that they are of God. He says, if one testifies, if one confesses that Jesus Christ has already come in the flesh, then that spirit is of God. He also says, if one does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, then you already know that that spirit is not of God. So you need to understand that that is the spirit of the Antichrist. He did not say that this is the Antichrist, but it is the spirit of the Antichrist. And he says that the fact of the matter, the spirit of the Antichrist has been promised to us. The spirit of the Antichrist has been one that has been lingering. And the Bible promised that the spirit of the Antichrist would come. He goes on to say, and that spirit of the Antichrist is already here. 
Look at what he says. He says in verse number three, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. There are so many men and women who are self-proclaimed prophets. They have proclaimed themselves to be everything that they are not. He says if they don't confess that Christ has already come, the first indication that they are not of God and they are of the devil is the fact that they have not confessed that Jesus Christ has already come in the flesh. Well, we know that there are other tests that we can look at to tell if a spirit is not of God. But he says right off the bat, first John says, try the spirit, try the spirit, be discerning. He says the first thing that you can that is an indicator that this spirit is not of God is that they don't even confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And in order for them to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, then they have to trust that Jesus Christ will be their savior. So in order for Jesus Christ to be their savior, they got to first believe that he's come in the flesh. Because if they don't believe that he has come in the flesh, then there's no real way for them to believe that Jesus came in the flesh, died, was buried, and rose from the dead. And therefore, if they don't believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead, then there is no way to salvation. Therefore, that spirit is of the Antichrist. He moves and he says, you are of God. Verse number four, first John chapter four, he says, but you, you little children, you people who have just confessed Christ, you members of the early church, you are of God. You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. While they still dealing with and struggling with whether or not Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you've already passed that. You have overcome it. And not, over, not only have you overcome the thought, you've also overcome the spirit of the Antichrist. He says you have overcome them. And then he goes on to say the reason why you have overcome them. Verse number four. This is many of our favorite passages right here in these few verses. He says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Wow. In other words, he who is in you, who is in you? The spirit, God's spirit, Jesus Christ, God himself, he who is in you is greater than those who are in the world. Whenever you are saved, whenever you are born again, whenever you trust Jesus Christ as your savior, in comes God the Father, in come God the Holy Spirit, in come Jesus the Christ. Without a prayer line, without a coliseum, without it, somebody laying their hands upon you, without you speaking in tongues, without you rolling on the floor, without you screaming and hollering, the Holy Spirit walks in when Jesus comes in. God the Father walks in when God the Son walks in. So when, once you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit is present in you. And oftentimes he is trying to get our attention when we're walking the wrong way when we're doing the wrong thing, when we're saying the wrong things, when we're acting the wrong way. The Holy Spirit is trying to get our attention. The Holy Spirit in us is greater than all the other spirits in the world. I told you on last week, woman said to me, I'm going to voodoo you. All I need is a picture. Well, she got plenty of them. Matter of fact, let me give you pictures because the greater one is in me. Now the stuff that we put on social media there are pictures all over the world. The greater one is in me. And because the greatest one, not just the greater one, when we use the word er, great er, when we use the word greater, we're comparing two. When we use the word great is, we're, prepared, con we're comparing two or uh, three or more. And not only is the greater one in us, but the greatest one is in us. 
There is none like our Holy Spirit, none like our Jesus Christ, none like our God. The greatest one is in us. I just want to let you know, if you're saved, you really got it going on. <laughs> if you're born again, you really, really got some things going well for yourself. The greater one is in you. Matter of fact, the greatest one is in you. So he says, this one who's in you is greater than all this in the world. All of these spirits, these spirits proclaim a lot of things. First of all, if they don't proclaim that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, they're not of God. Secondly, regardless of what they proclaim, regardless of what they say, regardless of what they do, and all these miracles that they may perform, the greater one is in you. The Holy Spirit himself. He resides in you. He lives in you. He has taken up residence in you. Praise the Lord that the greatest one is in you. The Holy Spirit. God himself dwells in us. He has made residence in us. He's sounding the alarm. Every time we're going the wrong way, we're doing the wrong thing. The Holy Spirit is sounding the alarm. Saying, don't go that way. Don't do that. The last time you were you were on your way out of the house and you had to turn around and go get something. The Holy Spirit unctioned you to turn around and go get it. And then if you had been just two minutes early, you would have been involved in this great accident. The Holy Spirit unctions us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit is great in us. Matter of fact, he's the greater one than all of the spirits in the world. Not only that, he is the greatest. He is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not a it. The Holy Spirit is God himself. He is the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit. So he says, test the spirit by the spirit. He says, make sure that these spirits are of God. Don't take for granted just because you know the person they are of God. If they deny the coming of Jesus Christ, that he has already come in the flesh, that he has walked these mundane shores, then this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Not only are, do they possess this spirit of the Antichrist, they are of the world. He says they are of the world. And because they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world. They speak as if they are of the world. You cannot depend on a worldly person, an ungodly person, to speak things of God. It just doesn't work that way. You have to make sure that you know what you're dealing with. The fact of the matter is we have too long expected ungodly people to speak godly things. A person walks up and they're talking ungodly stuff. I just fold my hands and listen because I don't expect those who are children of the devil to speak things that are of God. Don't even depend on it. He says, therefore, they speak as of as of the world and the world hears them. This world that we live in will always respond to worldly things. This world in which we live in, those who are not of Christ, those who have this adorning, this, 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 this symbol of satanic worship, this symbol of the Antichrist, they will always listen to those things that are not of God this antichrist spirit. Verse six, he says, we are of God. We are of God. I said, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He, he sets us up here. He says, we are of God. We are of God. Theos, the divine one. We are of God. And he who knows God 
He who has a relationship with God, he who understands God, he who knows God, hears us. Have you ever tried to tell somebody something and pretty much hold them accountable and they don't want to hear it? But let me tell you, those who are of God, they will hear you. I'm not talking about when you have a moment. Some, sometimes people go through a moment and they just can't hear anybody. And, and they turn out like a 13-year-old a girl who, who, who found some boy that they believe in so, so much until everybody sees that he's no good for her. Or a full-grown woman or a full-grown man, everybody outside them see that these people or this person is not good for you except you. Everybody understands, everybody's saying that this is a toxic relationship, but you. And because you can't see it, you dibble and dabble in the world, even Christians. I often tell young, time tell young people, you are a church person. You were reared in Sunday school. You were reared in church. That world out there will eat you alive. You're not, you're not situated for this world. You, you have not been prepared for this world. You don't even fit into this world. This world will suck you dry. This world will turn your life upside down. What you have to understand is the greatest one is in you. Don't let peer pressure, P-E-E-R, peer pressure get to you. And don't let peer pressure, P-U-R-E, get to you. The fact of the matter is, don't depend on people hearing you that are not of God. He says, he who knows God hears us. In other words, he who does not know God does not hear us. He who is not of God does not hear us. But by this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of truth is one that we follow and we believe in. And we do not follow and do not really know the spirit of error. The, the, the Antichrist is already the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. The Bible promised that the spirit of the Antichrist would come and that spirit of the Antichrist is already here. We move to verse number seven. He says, beloved, let, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He used love a lot here. He says, beloved, let us love one another. We ought to love one another. This is the brotherly love that we ought to have one to the other. As Christians, we ought to love each other. This, this, love, this love is both phileo and agape. What he's saying is that we ought to phileo, in, in other words, have brotherly love for each other. But we ought to have agape love for each other, meaning that we ought to have a love that's a continuous love. It's an unconditional love. And this unconditional love keeps going on and on and on. How do you know you love somebody unconditionally? Because when they make you mad, you keep loving them. When they get on your nerve, you keep loving them. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. We ought to practice love because love is of God. We ought to love to love because love is of God. We ought to look to love for love is of God. I was on my way home from the church today after a day of construction. <laughs> after a day of construction, I was on my way home today, uh, leaving the church, and I got to the, to the fork in the road, well, really a, a, a crossroad, and there was a, a seasoned lady standing outside of her car with a jug. A jug of water. So I, I made the U-turn, came around, come back, pulled behind her, put my mask on, strapped down, looked at her. I said, you all right? She said, well, my car is overheating. I just had it fixed by some, some uh, mechanic, and, and I'm calling him now. And, and she called the mechanic while I was standing there, and the mechanic told her after he has fixed the car and he has taken her money, 
He told her, drive it for 20 minutes and let it sit for 20 minutes until you get to the other side of town. So he told this lady who's about 40 miles from where she's going. He said to her after he has taken her money, he says to her, he says to her, tell you what you do. You drive it till it runs hot. And once it runs hot, you pull on the side of the road and you let it sit there for 20 to 30 minutes. And then you get back in your car and you drive again. It gets hot again. You pull on the side of the road. And in conversation with her, she said, thank you for stopping. I said, no problem. She says to me that this car has been stopping on me. I got it fixed. But when it stopped a few times, no man would even stop and help. She said it stopped in a parking lot and about five men standing there. She's struggling to put water in it. And she said not one single man offered a helping hand to her. Let me share with you the moment, the moment I stopped, she said to me, I was, I was, I was thinking I was leery about you helping me because no man has ever stopped to help me. And she said she par she's parked in the parking lot. She got a jug out five men standing there and no one even showed her help. It's because we have a famine, a famine of love. It means we are, we are dried out with love. We don't have people that that's showing love on a regular basis. I don't even understand how men can stand and watch this seasoned saint try to pour water in the car and not even walk to the car and tell her, Hey, we can help you or ask her, how can we help or tell her you shouldn't be pouring that, that cold water into a hot car right now. Not one single man. Stop the heifer. I'm telling you, there's a famine in the land and it's a famine on love. We, we have a famine where people are wanting to do their own thing, their own way, and they have no idea of how to help and will not go out of their way to help anybody. There's a famine in the land. And this famine is a famine on love. Love is missing. There's a famine on hope. I mean, people are in despair. And they're in despair because there's a lack of love. People will do whatever they want to do to whom they choose to do and don't think about God at all. Talking to one of the brothers of the church, and he was like, how can a, a group of people do this to God's house? How can they desecrate? How can they just come to a point where they desecrate God's house? Because there's a famine. And the famine is one that lacks love. He says in verse number seven, beloved, let us love one another. He's talking to the Christian church. He says, for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We are children of God. We are born again. We are born of God and we have to show love. It's, it's a part of our DNA. We are now saved. We are now born again. We are of God. Therefore, we have no choice. It's just a part of us. We can't help ourselves but love people. And I'm not talking about people in your household. I'm not talking about people in your family. I'm talking about a love for people. A love. And this woman that I pulled over to help, she was leery of allowing me to help her because she has seen a world of lovelessness. Yes, there's a famine in the land. This is a famine of no love, no hope, no peace. There's a famine in the land. And I grew up hearing R&B songs and soul songs about love and happiness. I grew up hearing songs about love, soul, and peace. I grew up listening to the soul train, watching the train come around the track, and it was all about soul, love, hope, and peace. When there was a time when we cared enough about each other to reach out and to help each other. 
John knew that this day was coming. Jesus knew that this day was coming. God knew that these days were coming. So God allowed John to pin these words even 2000 years ago before it happened. He says to us, we are born of God. He says to us, we are to love people because God is love. Love represents God. He says we are to love both philia or filio and agape. We are to love our brothers. We ought to have a love for our brothers in such a way that it ought to be unconditional. Now Jesus said, love those who despitefully use you. Love those who hate you. Love those who attack you. John picks this thought up and John says to us tonight in verse number seven, we know God, we know love, we're going to share God. Verse number eight, he says, he who does not love does not know God. Simple. If you have not love, you don't know God. You're just talking. Some writer would say you're just talking loud and saying nothing. And you have to show love. He, you have to exemplify love. You have to demonstrate love. He says, verse number eight, first John chapter four, verse number eight, he says, he who does not love does not know God for God is love. You can't be with God and don't love. You can't love if you are of God. You can't hate and, and have a lack of love because God is love. He says, he says it right here very clearly. Verse number eight, God is love. He who does not love does not know God, meaning that he has no connection to God. He has no understanding of God. He does not compare himself to those who are of God because he has not God. And it's obvious because he does not love because God is love. God himself is love. God loves us unconditionally. God loves us and he informs us to have brotherly love one for the other. Oh, yeah, he, he wants us to have Stargate love also, meaning that we ought to love our family members. He even wants us to have Eros type of love, meaning it's that hand holding, eye winking, holding hands in the park type of love. The kind of love that only can exist between a man and a woman. Eros type of love. The chill type of love, the, the winking type of love, the, the, the showing of expression of affection type of love. It's the Eros type of love. God wants us to have brotherly love. He wants us to have agape love. He wants us to have the storge love, meaning you love your family members. He wants us to have Eros love, and he wants all of, uh, of those love to be fitting in the right places. With the right people. At the right time. And in the right way. Verse number nine, he says, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us. In this, he's going to tell us after we get to this comma here. He says, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So that's action packed there. That's, that's fulfilling there. That's, that's telling the story here. He says, in this, the love, verse number nine, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us. When we were loveless, God expressed his love toward us. Even while we are not loving, God has expressed his love toward us. Even though we, God is still working on us. You know, people love to say that. They love to say that God is still working on me. God is still working on me. Please forgive me. God is still working on me. It's good to know that God's working on you, but God ought not still be working on you for the same thing he was working on you last year, last six months. Yes, God is working on all of us. What if 
you went to the doctor and you had surgery. And after you had surgery, six months later, the doctor said you need the same surgery in the same spot and he's going to do the same thing. And then six months later, he says, I'm going to have to cut you and laser you in the same spot in the same place. Now he wants to cut you in the same place for the same reason the third time. We wouldn't like that. The insurance wouldn't pay for that. We would tell the doctor, I'm not doing that. Well, why is it that we can claim over and over and over again that God is still working on me, God is still operating on me in the same place, the same way, with the same conclusion over and over again? You see, we know in the flesh, we know in our physical bodies, we don't want the doctor working on us over and over again. Let me tell you, the real doctor is Jesus. His name is Jesus and Jesus is working on us and he's working on all of us, but he ought not be working on us in the same spot, doing the same thing that he did six months ago. Let me just tell you this, God is working on me, but he ought not be working on me, John says, in love from now on. John, John says, in this we, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us. He's setting us up where we have no excuse. He says in this, the love of God was manifested. The love of God was demonstrated. The love of God was demonstrated toward us in that he gave his only begotten son. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world that we might live through him. Look at what he says now. He says, this world was such a wreck that Jesus Christ was the manifestation of God's love toward us. And God was not ashamed. God was not selfish. God just demonstrated his love toward us. He demonstrated his love toward us by his only begotten son. The word begotten means his only unique son. There's none like this son. Yeah, we are sons of God. We are daughters of God. We are children of God. But there is only one begotten son. God's only one of a kind son, God's only unique son. His name is Jesus the Christ, the son of God. He is God's only unique son that came into the world that we might live through him. In other words, we, we can't love on our own and God understands that. We cannot make it on our own. God understands that. We cannot put ourselves in a position to continue to love people unconditionally on our own, but we are able to do it through the only begotten son of God, Jesus Christ himself. He says the son of God came into the world that we might live through him. Our lives are through him. Our demonstration of love is through him. We don't understand what to do and how to do it unless we get to know him. He says that God sent his son, Jesus the Christ, into the world as a demonstration to us of what we ought to be doing. We love. And if God can do it, don't, don't let me get ahead of myself. If God can do it for us, we ought to be able to do it for mankind. Love. In verse number 10, he, he says, in, and in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the perpetuation, propitiation, the propitiation for our sins. Satisfaction. When, when Jesus came, he gave his life, he rose from the dead, then that was God's satisfaction. Propitiation, he was the propitiation for our sin. He set us straight. 
He put us on straight street. This word perpetuation means that it satisfied God. God was not satisfied until Jesus had given his life. <laughs> Growing up as a boy, mama, daddy, big mama, big daddy, all of them would say, uh, you ain't going to be satisfied <laughs> until I get you. See, in those days, CPS wasn't too involved. Matter of fact, they weren't going to drive in the country anyway. They would say, they would make this statement. You are just not going to be satisfied until you had to take that long walk. And when they talked about the long walk, you knew what the long walk was. The walk was to go out there to that weeping willow tree and get me three switches and bring all three of them back. And they would take those weeping willow trees and they would thread them and, and, and plait them like you're plaiting a woman's hair. And they would say, you're not gonna be satisfied until you had to take that long walk. And when you took that walk, you go out there and get a little bit of switch and bring it back. That ain't gonna work. Now you just made everybody in the house mad. You go out there and get a real switch. What they were saying is, you are not gonna be satisfied because you keep doing the same thing that I've told you not to do one time. And they didn't say it over and over again. I've told you not to do it and you're not gonna be satisfied until something bad happened. Let me tell you, God was not satisfied until something bad happened to Jesus. Oh, we call it Good Friday because it's good for us. But when they take a man and they kill him, an innocent man and kill him, that's a bad thing. I don't care how you whip it, how you look at it. I don't care how you shake it, how you bake it. That's a bad thing. I used to wonder as a boy, why do they call it Good Friday when Jesus died such a horrible death on Friday and they call it Good Friday. Well, they call it Good Friday because God was manifesting his love toward us. He was giving his love toward us. He was demonstrating his love toward us. God gave us his very, very best he ever had. His name is Jesus. So Jesus became the propitiation for our sin. He became the affection of God for our sin. He became the satisfaction. God was not satisfied until something bad happened. That bad thing that happened is Jesus' death on Calvary. God wasn't satisfied until Jesus died on Calvary, but God always turned things around. It, when something bad happened, it's really something good. And let me tell you, it was a bad thing that happened, but it's the best thing that could have happened to us. The songwriter says, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. You see, God was demonstrating his love toward us. He manifested his love toward us by giving us Jesus. People ask the question all the time, if it wasn't for Jesus, where would I be? I know where you would be in hell or on your way but Jesus died for you. <laughs> That's good news. That's what makes it Good Friday because if it had not been good for Good Friday, we wouldn't have a good conclusion. If it had not been for Good Friday, we wouldn't have a good destination. Thank God for Good Friday, for his death, burial, and resurrection. Thank God for Jesus. Verse number 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin, the satisfaction that God gave. He, he set us straight. He took a bitter dispute and brought it to a happy ending. Only Jesus could do it. Last verse for tonight. Beloved or beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He spent these last few verses from verse seven to verse 11 saying to us tonight, love each other. I'm telling you, love each other. He's telling Christians, love each other. I'm afraid that when I look at Christians and I look for, I look for demonstrations of love, I sometimes can see that the wino and the dope dealers and the dope addicts have more love for each other than Christians do.
But he says, if he can take his son and allow him to be killed and demonstrate his love toward us, how much so can we can just demonstrate how much so ought we to love one another? We ought to just love each other. We ought to just love, just love, just, just show, demonstrate love. Just let love manifest itself. Don't always be looking for something wrong. Don't always look down on other people. Show them love. Look for, look for opportunity to love. Look for opportunity to show love. Look for opportunity to demonstrate love, the love of Jesus Christ. He says, if God allowed his love to be demonstrated, why can't we allow our love to be demonstrated to all mankind? He says to us, we are the love. Just, just show people love. Just love them. I will say that the Christian body here in Houston and throughout the United States, the Christian body has shown the New Beginning Church much love. The Christian body has shown, and if any members of the New Beginning Church wondered where we stand when it comes to the Christian body showing us love, the Christian body has shown us love in these tough days. For, for, for two, then it went to three, and now it's headed to four Sundays. The Christian body has gotten together, given their resources, showing us love. He says individuals, the Christian body, the, the, the congregations ought to be able to show love one toward the other. I, I'm just so good and I'm so glad and so proud to be a part of a, of a clergy group that will reach out in times like these. I am so glad to know ministry partners that will reach out in times like these. And they didn't, they didn't call me and say, uh, I'm going to be praying for you. They said that I'm going to show you. Not in those words. They said, look for something. And some of them have called me and ran me down. Tonight, after Bible study, a guy is coming by the house from a church to show love. And let me tell you, New Beginning Church, we are so blessed to have organizations that we didn't know whether they were Christian organizations or not. Um, companies, they don't even claim Christianity. Clubs, uh, people who have never expressed their love for Christ before. And then you have pastors and preachers and individuals and churches and para ministry and para churches just demonstrating the text tonight says we know God. And since we know God, we're going to demonstrate it. And as I thought about it today, I thought about when churches were in trouble and our church couldn't afford to give. We found a way to give. We found a way to show love. When we were trying to take two nickels and rub them together, we still gave. And I kept telling for years and years, for the last 18 years, I've said, I've said to our church, when they say that we, we're not meeting the ends, we, we, we're not making budget. I said, well, write a hundred dollar check to this ministry, give a $50 check to this ministry. And we just only give 50 here, hundred here. And God has showered us down when we needed it the most. Because I'm going to tell you, these last three, four weeks has been more precious and more pressure than even when we were building the building. But God has brought people in our arena, has brought people in our path and situated them right where we can be blessed by them. And that's why that's why I'm asking our, our church to step up. I'm asking every adult to give $250, every adult to give $250 toward our building fund. I'm asking every youth to give $50 toward our building fund. And yeah, you can do it in installments. 
It's a demonstration of love. And we cannot allow other people to give to our projects and we're not giving to it. So let's let's band together. Let's show love, show love for our church. There will used to be a time where men who were drunkards would show love for their church. Men who would who who would pass by the church that and when they get close to the church, they'll, they'll put the bottle down and stop drinking. There used to be a time where men who were not in church will protect the church. Now we got men who will destroy everything about the church. But now we have people such as as Weedy saying count us in. Saying that we we gonna give and we have given and, and we wanna give more. It's because it's a demonstration of love. And in the midst of this demonstration of love, I just look at the fact that we have given over the last 18 years and we've kept on giving even when we were short. Now look at what God is doing now. I'm telling you, it, it is good measure. It is pressed down. It is shaken together. It is running over. And you don't have to miss the last part of that verse because it says to us, God will cause men to give unto you. And let me tell you, God has caused men to give to the New Beginning Church. They are demonstrating and expressing and manifesting love. And I'm so glad about it. I'm so glad about it that when you know men love God, you can tell because they demonstrate, demonstrate love. The text declares in verse number nine that God demonstrated his love. He did it through Jesus Christ over 2000 years ago. God gave his very best. He didn't hold anything back for later. He gave Jesus Christ his only begotten, only one of a kind son, he kill, allowed mean men to kill him. He gave him to die. Jesus came to this world to die for mankind because he was demonstrating his love for us. And if you listen to this broadcast today and you've never trusted Jesus as your personal savior, I just want to tell you that God loves you. And God has demonstrated his love for you over 2000 years ago by allowing Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you and for me. But you need to accept him tonight. You need to trust him tonight. You need to invite him in tonight. Jesus the Christ. Over 2000 years ago, he died on Calvary. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. Will you trust him tonight? Will you trust that this story will take you from earth to heaven? You can be saved right here tonight. You can be born right here tonight without an organist, without a piano, with, without a, a guitar, without a saxophone. You can be saved right here, right now, tonight. You need to trust Jesus as your personal savior. And you can do that tonight by just joining me in prayer, repeating after me, and just buying your head right where you are. If you're driving, pull over, just bow your head right where you are and invite Jesus Christ into your life. You don't need a church building. You can do it right here, right now. Just bow your head with me and repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus name I pray, amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer, believing that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, we believe that you're born again. You're saved right here, right now. We believe that you're on your way to heaven. Just trust him and walk with him. We believe that you need to be in a good Bible teaching church. We believe that you need to be in a church that respects God and a church that is led by Jesus the Christ. A church where we understand that the greatest one is in us. I recommend the New Beginning Church. Southeast Houston, you can be a global member or you can be a local member. 
if you just trust him today. Inbox us. Let us know you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church and you want to walk in love with us as we are loving God and God is loving us and we are loving each other. Please inbox us and let us know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. We welcome you. If you receive Jesus Christ on this broadcast tonight, let us know that you've received. Inbox us. Let us know that you've received him and call us and let us know so we can rejoice with you and celebrate with you at the New Beginning Church. And those of you who struggle with sin, as we come to the end of our broadcast, we're going to lift each other in prayer and, and ask God to bless us and ask God to recharge and rejuvenate us and ask God to be a blessing in our, in our lives and in the lives of so many others. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. For those of you who are listening to this broadcast, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or if you choose to mail in uh, your love offering or your, your offering to our church, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. We'll be glad to fellowship with you. We'll be glad for, for you to participate. And those of you who are sending money by way of Zelle or mailing it in and you want to give to our, our tragic <laughs> situation that we're going through, please make it clear that you want it to go to the building fund, the building fund. And please, ma'am, please, sir, put your contact information, name, address, phone number, put your whole address with the zip code on there so we can just thank you for what you're doing. And if you're giving to our cause that we are in the midst of right now, make it to the building fund, the building fund, and we'll be glad, be glad and overjoyed to uh, thank you for it, give you a tax deduction, Whatever you need from us, we would do that. But thank you so much to all of you who have been so kind and have blessed us so much. We appreciate you. We thank you for demonstrating, as the lesson says tonight, your love towards your brother and sister in Christ. And God is blessing us. God is putting us everything back together. And God is going to address all that that is there. Again, our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our Bible study. Thank you for participating with us and thank you for giving uh, the way you have been given. Also, we want to make sure that we do our part as members of the New Beginning Church. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for these words that have jumped off the page. We pray, Father God, that you bless us to walk in love. Bless us, Father God, to love each other. And bless us, Father God, to follow the example of Jesus the Christ. God has given his son and Jesus has given his life. Bless us to be givers and not takers. Bless us, Father God, that every giver that have give, every giver that has given, and every giver that will give, bless them that they will have what they given and that which will overflow. Bless them that it will manifest itself and 100 fold. Bless them, Father God, to know them, to know you in a very special way and know that you are blessing them. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by saying, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.